Um, we're going to go ahead and get started here this morning. Um, <clears throat> my name is Jim Long and, uh, with Corporate Training and Development, and uh, I just want to thank you all for coming. Um, we have uh, uh, the pleasure this morning of, of hearing from consultants from SWI, SWI Incorporated, that is uh, Svenson and Wallace, and um, Ray Svenson is, um, I guess my, my first introduction to Ray and his work was the, uh, his work in the um, training strategy um, handbook okay and uh that stan turnipseed uh introduced me to a couple years ago and it's since been widely cir circulated around the lily training community um actually today they're here as a result of an association that they've had with mark schrader our new director of the organizational effectiveness group and so um they're going to be giving a couple presentations here this morning so over here on my left is ray Svenson and Karen Wallace, and Guy Wallace. And uh, Guy is going to be giving the first presentation, and it's on the subject of curriculum architecture. Um, Guy has um, actually delivered this presentation uh, 10 times over the last several years at NSPI conferences and S STD confer um, ASTD conferences. Um, around the country and so what you have in front of you is a presentation that's been given many times over the last years and has kind of evolved Should work, kind of <laughs> <laughs> great so each one of these folks is going to give a little bit more detailed background about themselves i'm going to at this point turn it over to uh, guy wallace good morning. good morning so what the heck is a curriculum architecture anyway uh, I just met with, uh, in the last two weeks I've been meeting with a lot of prospects and existing clients of ours and talking about this concept of curriculum architecture, so I'm probably going to forget what I've already told you and what I didn't tell you because I've been talking about this so much. But part of what we're going to do is, is demystify the concept of a curriculum architecture design. Uh, we abbreviate this to, to refer to it as CAD. Um, Part of this is the concept of curriculum management, much like product management in a company. You probably have somebody who's in charge of bringing products to market. They, they maybe run a team, involve a lot of different people, and they make decisions and they keep it moving and they bring products to market. We're going to be talking about you bringing training products to your own internal markets. And how do you begin to consider doing that and what are the decisions that you go through and how do you turn all this training stuff into business stuff? We'll talk about <clears throat> the process, and we'll get into some level of detail about that. We have four phases for doing that. It's kind of arbitrary, but it's a way to begin to gate the whole methodology for doing this so we can chunk it out into pieces so that you can understand what happens in each one of these phases and, and how might you modify that. What I'm going to present will look very rote, very specific, very unforgiving. In fact, it's a very flexible process. There's a lot of iterative points in it where it may not appear that way the way I've written this all up but there's a lot of room for recovery if something goes wrong in this. Um, we'll then talk about some of the post-project curriculum management issues. All this is being done under a methodology that we call PACT, creating a bargain with your customer. And PACT stands for performance-based because there's a performance model that drives all of this. We are anchored to performance. Nothing can be done in this process that you can't validate vis-a-vis some are understanding, some articulation of performance, human performance within business processes. The A stands for accelerated. We're using teams. You don't have to use teams, but if you use teams, you'll accelerate your way through this process. We can do a curriculum architecture design for a client in, in less than 10 days if they don't have to have it all word processed and pretty from one phase to the next. So it can be a very accelerated process. C stands for customer driven. We engage the customer. We turn over turn over the keys to the project to them, they own it. One of our sayings is that we own the process, they own the content. And together, if we collaborate, we'll produce great training. They can probably produce better training by themselves than without us, than we can by ourselves. So how do we engage the customer where the subject matter expertise, where the understanding of the business processes truly lies? How do we marry our understanding of training 
instructional technology, et cetera, to that. And the T stands for training, which narrows it too narrow for some people. <clears throat> We're all interested in the learning organization and learning events and training I'm using in a very, very, very broad sense. It includes job assignments, structured OJT, unstructured OJT, if we wish to leave it as it might already exist. But we'll cover some more of this again. It's a little bit of my background. I have a radio TV film degree. <clears throat> they hired me into a training department thinking that I'd work with the video people, work on the video side, and immediately I became a program developer working with those people in video. <clears throat> I worked at Wix Lumber in Saginaw, Michigan for a couple years as a program developer. I'd worked in the field as a, when I was a college student working part-time for them. From there, I went to what's now known as Motorola University. That's where I met Ray Svensson. and he was doing strategic planning for what was then MTech. I just spent a couple of years there, and then <clears throat> uh, the head of Motorola University put Ray and my wife Karen together in a partnership, said, suggested they work together, and then I decided they were doing a good thing, and I left Motorola and joined them. Pete Hybert also, teaches, or also delivers this presentation. This is an encore presentation from NSPI, so we've done it two years in a row. He was doing it. He's just not here this morning. We decided not to change any of the slides, give him some credit also. We've applied this concept of a curriculum architecture, and again, I haven't demystified that yet for you, but basically it's applied to lots of different kinds of jobs, lots of different applications within the world of work. Technical positions, managerial positions, R&D positions, et cetera, et cetera. So I've learned a little bit of about a lot, but not too deep in anything in all those areas. These are our customers. My purpose in showing you all of this is not to impress you with this, but to show you this has widespread application, and this has been done a lot. I've done over 75 of these projects myself in the last 13 years. I've got a lot of experience doing them. We have continuously improved the process over time. Our first article that we wrote about this and published was in 84 in Training Magazine. So this is something we personally have, a, or we collectively have a lot of experience in. All right, the next thing is the concept of curriculum management. And basically, it's a trainer, it's a supplier customer perspective. You provide products and services to a marketplace. <clears throat> Just like any company that's in the business to do that, <clears throat> there's good ways of doing that and some bad ways of doing that. You, you, you train the organization personnel, whatever your titles are. You're part of a curriculum management process. You're the product managers or brand managers or whatever you call that in your business, and I'm not familiar with your company yet to understand how to translate this. That'll be one of the tricks. If you embrace any of these concepts, immediately translate them into the language of your customers. Don't keep it in our training jargon, because no one wants to learn that stuff, especially our customers. But the training product line, if you will, is a curriculum. And what we're talking about is architecting, designing that. Up front, before we build it all, or building a design around all the existing piece parts that we like and want to keep, how do we understand the entire product line of training and what could be so that we can make business decisions about what should be training that's brought to the marketplace? Just like any product management group can look at all the products that they could bring to the market, they only bring a subset of those to the market because the returns on investment, the limitations in the amount of resources that you can apply to this at any one point in time. So you can't do everything. So how do you make a down select the appropriate things that will impact the business? That's what you're in the business of delivering training products to the marketplace. Again, at the bottom here, the term training is used in a very broad sense to include education, where we teach people stuff where we don't know exactly how they're going to apply it and that's okay, or training when we know exactly what the application is, or developmental assignments because we want them to learn and get some experience out there in the real world, <coughs> hopefully in some sort of a controlled manner, where there are learnings that are prescribed or targeted within all of that. And then, as I mentioned, structured and un unstructured on the job training. If you don't have any training today on things, basically we consider it's unstructured OJT. We just probably haven't given a label to it. Got to understand your marketplace. You got to understand your products vis-a-vis -vis the marketplace. So what are the segments of your marketplace? Segmentation schemes from marketeers would suggest that there's many ways to carve up a market and segment it. The one that you should use is the one that gives you greatest insight for your purposes. There is no one right way. You probably have to do it a couple different ways to gain that insight. But you ought to be able to, look, be able to look at your customers in one sense and understand how does that line up with your training products? Who is this product for? What were their real needs? 
And if you don't do that, basically, your customers will drive you out of business because they'll go elsewhere. And whether that's them clamoring for you to get reduced funding in the future, so funding can go someplace else where somebody else can take better care of their needs, or they just have you shut down. When I was at Motorola, I was there at the start of what's now MTech. They hadn't had corporate training in 10 years because corporate training didn't work for the corporation. And they decentralized it all. And that didn't work either. So then they centralized it all. And now they've got both. Your training system needs to be somewhat modular, we think, because you need to meet the needs of a diverse marketplace. You might have various jobs, red jobs, blue jobs, green jobs, etc., and you have a bunch of modules, sub-assemblies of your product, some of which are needed by your customer. When I buy a car, I've got CDs now. I don't buy a car with a cassette tape player. I buy one with, the, with CDs. Somebody else might want to still buy the one with a cassette. How does that manufacturer build a flexible product, reducing their costs as they do that to meet the needs of the marketplace, which do differ? But I still need brakes. So do you. And Ford Motor Company and General Motors do not put a different brake system on each and every car that they have. They have got maybe 17 brakes for 87 different kinds of cars. That reduces their cost to be in business. These multiple training modules, that's our title for the sub-assembly modules, must be available for custom configuration and training events. You can have standard training events, your standard deliverable, and ways to do it custom. Take it apart at the module level and reconfigure to meet a specific customer's need. That, again, provides you with some flexibility in meeting those needs. Training products must be updated easily. We know that there is going to be continuous change. That is the only guarantee that we have. So if we can anticipate that, how do we get our act together so that we can better deal with it as it comes and hits us day after day, quarter after quarter? <clears throat> a training curriculum that's merely a collection of courses <clears throat> probably isn't going to have a lot of return on investment. It may not just be nil, it may be negative. And your shareholders of the corporation do not want you to be squandering the resources on just training stuff. It's there for a reason. It's a business reason. Okay, this concept of a curriculum architecture is simply the entire system of training that could be understood in an event product level and the sub-assembly level with an understanding of all the target audiences. <coughs> There's, and what we have here on the left is a way to organize the inventory of all the modules. It's not how the product looks. It's simply if you were to go into the factory, the training factory here, and, and look around, you'd be, it'd be the equivalent of looking for all the electrical things and all the fuel delivery systems things and all the brake systems things, and all the sheet metal. This is a way to organize your understanding of all the training piece parts. Hopefully so you can divide it up for all the training resources to participate in creating and updating and delivering. There's got to be some central control here that says here's what the whole product line looks like. It's the only reason that somebody like Ford can have component plants where they make components, ship them to assembly plants and make them and they actually all fit together or they do better nowadays. They didn't do so well before. Job number one, that's the first car off the assembly line. It's supposed to be done with quality. It used to be used to determine, so what's wrong with this one and how do we go fix it and go back up the entire line and fix everything back? <clears throat> no, the concept now, which was a radical concept, was that by the time that first one rolled off the line, it was very good. It had quality, and that was the driver. Well, the performance based CAD organizes all your training into uh, structures, in this, and it's got some logic behind it. It understands the target audience. It understands management's prioritization. If we can identify 5,000 chunks of training here, some one of them has to be priority number 5,000. Let's hope no one ever builds that one. That may be the easiest one to build, may have the less contentiousness with the customers. It's probably time management or something like that. However, time management applied to R&D organizations or sales organizations or a business manager or somebody else is probably a very different application. Those concepts and theories may be a chunk of what's needed, but probably what I need as a learner is, what do I do with that? How do I apply this to my world? Great concepts, but what do I do with that? Well, we need to have those kinds of things in there also. So I might have a supporting knowledge and skills <clears throat> module, if you will, of time management. And down here, it teaches me how to do something with that. Because there's probably some master performers somewhere in the system that have already figured that out. Why don't we steal benchmark from them and train me on 
their shortcuts, their tricks of the trade. <coughs> so that's one of the things that a CAD can do for you. It'll take those generic knowledge and skills, like presentation skills, and teach you how to do something real with it for your job, if that's a priority. If it's not a priority, then we don't do that either. <clears throat> One experience I had with presentation skills that I think is interesting is that we worked with a client and they wanted a three-week long presentation skills course. We said, gee, you know, you can buy those. They're about, you know, one to three days, five days at the most. We're presenting to Congress. It was NASA. <clears throat> that's a different presentation skill set. <laughs> yes, Senator. And then the truth spews forth, you know. Um, and that mo training module is matched to a performance model that said, yeah, we're presenting to Congress. Okay, so we do need presentation skills, but it's not the same thing as we might have thought otherwise. And it was definitely a need to know versus a nice to know. We could prove that to ourselves because we had a performance model of what this performer was doing, what they're on the payroll to do. Training modules can be reconfigured into various training events for specific needs. Again, if a company bus at the picnic rolls over and the entire department is lost for two weeks or two months because they're in the hospital, we need to bring in some temporaries or people from around the organization and train them up to do the job because the job goes on. <clears throat> How do we deal with something like that? Well, we may be able to take apart existing training real quickly and customize a delivery <coughs> for those temps. We've got to make sure that no training module or event is developed or purchased that doesn't par become part of the integral whole. How does it fit? How does it fit now in the, in the, when it's first introduced? Maybe very different than how it's integrated later on. If you're going to focus on something like diversity training right now, you've got to take diverse, something like diversity training and make a big deal about it. You've got to make a political statement with something like that. We've, I've been dealing with clients on this for a long time. So you will do things like that, getting ready for Workforce 2000. But so you can put it on a pedestal and have it be a standalone course. And I've heard training folks complain about this. But we don't teach anybody what to really do with it. Yeah, that's because you haven't figured out yet what to do with it and where it really applies. But it's a great, it is a concept. It's part of the future. You put something like that out there. Then you take that course apart at some point in the future and you integrate where you use your diversity sensitivity and the diversity things <coughs> in the real world, like in hiring, performance appraisal, and things like that. There are applications for those things and probably many more. But right now it's such a political hot button that it's one of those things you don't want to touch. So just build your diversity course, put it out there. Understand how you might take it apart later on and integrate it piece part into other things. If you figure that out today before you build the course, you'll have less cost when you make that change. <clears throat> Training events may be better sequenced so that employees learn the most important skills first. Over here is a, ver is a representation of a curriculum path. It's got the courses, the uh, training events on there. Some of you may be familiar with Spartan Explorers. They just re-engineered for a pr price tag of $72 million for a promise of $550 million. Somebody forgot to calculate the training costs into that investment. So the return $550 was going to be held hostage to an unknown training investment. It'll take the $72 up higher. How high? They didn't know. So we did a curriculum architecture on the entire company in the midst of re-engineering. So that meant every module spec, every training event spec is probably not quite right because the re-engineering dust hadn't settled yet. The total price tag for all their training to support re-engineering was $10 million. The high priority stuff was only $3 million. So for $3 million, they could assure that the processes basically would work because people would be trained how to operate in the new processes. And so the investment now was not 72, but 75 for the promise of 550. This path on the left there basically has a phase one, phase two, phase three. You can call them anything you want, and that's all kind of arbitrary. There's a lot of arbitrary decisions in something like this, and we will make those too. But phase one is basically survival skills training. That's the concept. So we basically build a path. We don't show somebody a course catalog. We've excerpt all the things relative to their job. We down-selected and put it on a path so they don't have to look at all the other stuff for all the other target audiences, which is just confusing because it's organized by alpha or something else. This is organized by what they might want to consider first and what they might want to consider second and then third in planning training for an individual because we know something about the job because we modeled the performance, we derive the knowledge and skills, we understand what we think that they need. But that individual is, comes to the job with, with different knowledges and experiences and they're not all the same. So this path just starts the planning process. It isn't what they will do, it's what we think that they should consider in what sequence. 
However, if they've got a project coming up next week and they, they need skills for this right now, for everybody, you train on this right now. You won't wait until you come through the cycle. So we're not imposing something on, we're giving a tool to help somebody plan training better. And so this allows the supervisor or team leader or team or individual all by them lonesome here to kind of plan their training and decide what is it they need in order to help them do the job. And if they come up with too long a list here, they should be able to prioritize that down to what's really critical because we can't afford everything that we need. We've got to only deal with the critical stuff. <clears throat> so that if em employees learn the most important skills first, they should perform better. Training produces focus and measurable but improvements in on-the-job performance. That's what this is all about. And how do you make that happen? How do you make your product line be effective? The project is intended to use customer participation to develop ownership of the curriculum architecture design. If you're dealing with an engineering group or R&D group, who should own the curriculum architecture design? The training community or the customer? Well, you're the, you're the keepers of the curriculum, but it should be theirs. So you want them to own it for a bunch of different reasons we'll get into a little bit later too. Identify the component modules of training and all their content specifications. What we're doing in a curriculum architecture design is we're doing macro analysis and macro design, not micro. We do not get hung up in analysis paralysis, therefore. We do enough of this analysis and design <clears throat> so that business decisions can be made about training products. We defer detailed analysis and design until it's time. For the number one priority module or training event, we'll go do that micro needs analysis and design so we can actually build the training course. We didn't need to do that on priority number 5,000. If we had spent our time and energy up on the very front analyzing everything to death, well, by the time we went and developed it all, it would all be wrong anyway. Things are changing. So we need to do enough in order to make business decisions about the architecture of training so we can prioritize those things. We can give insight, help our customers gain insight as to what training that could be, should be, because it'll help them with their business. And we training folks may be real good at uncovering what the training requirements are, but we don't understand the business and what's really critical and important. We may have some clues and cues from out there doing our analyses, but maybe not. We want to identify the depth of coverage, estimated lengths, preliminary delivery strategies, development priorities, et cetera, for these chunks of training so that our customers can basically say, yeah, these, make, make these, bring these to the market. And oh, the way, oh, by the way, guy, on these, don't you ever let me catch you bringing these products to the market. They have absolutely, these are silly relative to the things that are really critical. Linking training models to performance models and related knowledge and skill requirements assures us that training is performance-based. How do you get it performance-based? How do you anchor to performance? Well, this method will give you away. This will allow you to develop flexible sequence, job generic, and individually tailorable curriculum paths through the curriculum. That's what I was just talking about before. We can give a suggested menu of training in a suggested sequence and let them go from there. If there's things we have to mandate because of requirements, we can plug those in and make sure that they happen where they have to. There can be electives and there can be core and there can be mandated kind of training. I understand you've got a lot of mandated kinds of training that you have to deal with here. You can fit that in also. Uh, it can allow for a multi-year phased implementation effort, <clears throat> depending on how much training you've got vis-a-vis -vis your need and how much you're willing to resource that. It may take you years to put this in place and build this. Well, you can't do it if you don't have a blueprint. And you can't divvy up the work across all the training entities and share the workload because there's more than enough work for all of you. I've got to believe. Got to believe it. Job security. In a very insecure world, it's a good feeling. Only if we do it right. Now I'm going to focus in on some of the design outputs here. There's this five-tier module inventory structure. If you've got 5,000 training modules, some of them which are two pages long all the way up to 20 days long, modules of all sorts of different sizes, delivered all sorts of different ways, books, videos, traditional classroom stuff in the conference rooms, lab kinds of things because you need a Bunsen burner or a computer in the room, all of that. How do you organize that so that you can utilize that in your design? Your product line is very different, and I don't know enough about it, so I'm speaking in ignorance, and I apologize for that. But, but if I'm a master designer creating the next product, I ought to go to the bin here 
of all the things that we already have or could have and design based on these components. That's what the engineering populations in General Motors are supposed to be doing. Build your new design of your new car based on the old products and minimize all the new stuff so we reduce our costs. But use the old brake system guy. Use the same radio. Let's not have a different radio in this car. But you, so we're trying to increase the shareability of all these things. We have to have some visibility about what is it that we could share. Now, you don't put the same brake system on a Corvette as you do on a Chevette. But the radio can be the same. So if we, for every one of these little chunks, these modules here, we can create a spec sheet, a module specification sheet, not a module design, a spec sheet, so that our customers can decide which prior, what kind of a priority does this one have relative to all the rest. Then we can bundle all of those modules into events, the products, and identify, well, what's the modularity composition of this thing and what do we have? There's bigger copies of some of this later on. And then we can put those in a path. You can put them in a course catalog also, but I'm not sure why. Well, maybe because I, a learner, want to see other jobs things and look at paths or just other kinds of training for whatever reasons. So maybe there is a catalog, online or off or whatever, that I can go. But basically, this is where my focus should be because this is where my peer group has decided this is the training we should consider. If I'm a materials handler, this is it because the material handling populations were engaged in the process. They own the content. The training folks just own the process, and the content is correct, and so the titles and the content of that, that courseware, that learning stuff, should be appropriate. And if it's not, like in the real world, we'll continue to improve it until we get it to where it needs to be, if that's worthy of our investment. The process, customer participation and control. Hopefully, it'll increase implementation, resourcing, and support from the customer because they understand it. One of the tricks that I've learned in doing one of these projects, and you'll see, this gets kind of complicated. What we're dealing with is something that's inherently complex. I don't think a very simplistic approach to this is going to do. You do not design an automobile with a very simplistic set of processes. You try to keep it towards the simple side, but you've got to step up to the complexity in this thing. So you gotta, if it's going to end up with a very complex thing, your customer better have been taken along for the ride so that they understand it, because if you show it all to them at the very end, they're not going to understand it. In fact, they're going to hate it because it's so darn complex, they can't get their arms around it, and they know something is funny is going on, or they think something funny is going on. But you want to get increased support from the customer, and that's going to come from their understanding and ownership of the final product. <clears throat> the modules and events linked to performance model, you have more impact on performance if everything is focused on performance from the very beginning. The content boundaries here will, of modules will minimize gaps and overlaps in available training. When I was at Motorola, I supported manufacturing materials and purchasing. They sent me out to look at soldering courses across the corporation. I found 18. I know I didn't find them all. I found 18. Seventy-five percent of the content was the same. That had been going on for 20 years. That's very costly. A lot of other worthy training was not developed and put in place because of that. Maybe that's why we didn't have airbags until recently. <laughs> Somebody was reinventing the radio or something. Uh, defining the, uh, <clears throat> okay, module sharing between, this sharing, we're not talking about sharing just for the trying to force fit and share everything. That is very in, uh, inappropriate. And if you talk to your customers about sharing training with R&D and sales marketing, they already hate that. They know that because they've been in that kind of training before where it's all generic and worthless and basically a waste of their time. None of you are shaking your heads this way. Some of you are doing this little perceptive nod. I've been there. I've been beat up on all this stuff. I'm just sharing you all the beatings. Everything that I've been told is wrong about me. I share the pain. Job-based curriculum paths for proactive training planning at the individual contributor level. If you had these paths, and they truly represented that, basically we're increasing the visibility of training. Hopefully, because the customer was involved in the process, they understand that this will be good stuff. And they might plan, well, they may participate in that a little bit more. They'll increase the value and impact of training if they actually use it, and they'll increase the attention of training. Before you know it, we'll have this demand situation where we can't keep up again. Hopefully. Okay, the process overview. We have four phases to do this. 
And like mo most new product development processes, which this is but one, this is very similar to quality function deployment for those of you in the quality world who understand that complex process to figure things out. We've broken this down in these four phases, and then we recognize that there's some post-project curriculum management stuff, like if your implementation planning is going on here, somebody's actually got to implement, which is a whole new world. And then there's keeping all the data that was part of the original design evergreen, because if jobs change, if job task assignments change on a team from one team member to another, on their curriculum path, the content should change. Maybe the events on the path don't change. Maybe it's the content inside, or maybe entire training events move from one path to another. It depends. And it could happen all those different ways. And how are you going to control something like that? Because you're either going to be in control or not. And even being not in control in areas should be a deliberate business decision <clears throat> because it has a business impact. These are not training decisions. These are business decisions. The method, we use a participative facilitated team analysis and design process. We do analysis and design live in front of a group of people. You've got to have a strong ego to do that because everything you do and put on the flip chart is going to be wrong the first time and they're going to correct you and you've got to be able to keep on going with that. We use subject matter experts. We all know who they are. I like to differentiate master performers from subject matter experts. Master performers before my meetings were doing the job at a mastery level. Different than somebody who knows a lot about it, had the job five years ago, understand some of the changes around the corner here from staff planning, those kinds of things. <clears throat> but those are different cats. Then the novice performer, maybe somebody who's got six to 12 months on the job and can tell the old timers, look, I realize you're a master performer, but I just went through this. This is what you need on day one. This is what I need on day one. This is what I need on day one. I just went through this. I just got burned severely. I know this better than you do. Probably merging the insights of those two kinds of groups can be very, very powerful. Management and supervisory personnel, team leaders, whatever you're going to call folks like this in the new world, they have typically a broader perspective, simply because we've not given the broad perspective to the individual contributors, so we've basically given that to management, so there we are. And basically, they understand, hey, we're doing this here because downstream 47 steps, unbeknownst to almost everybody, this is what's really critical and important. <clears throat> well, that's a theory, I guess, that maybe they know that. At Motorola, we call it line of sight. You look, go down the factory, your line of sight. I can see this far, I can see this far. That's, I guess, our world. OK, I can optimize within this, which means I might very well optimize this wonderfully and sub-optimize the whole thing, because I don't have line of sight all the way end to end. That's an issue for designers of training, too. They'll optimize the individual course, and they'll sub-optimize the whole system of learning. Inadvertently, they were trying to do their, the best that they could. They, we try very hard. Automobile design engineers will do the same thing. They'll optimize this piece here and drive up the cost for everything around them. And they don't know that. They don't get to see that. Hopefully some systems engineer caught them and sent them back to square three or four, not hopefully one, but made them start over again. We want to analyze work performance requirements first. So what's the job? People on the payroll to do what? Then we can systematically derive the knowledge and skills that enable that performance. Then we can look at, specify our training system design criteria. So if we're to create a training system to address this, what do you want it to be? What do you not want it to be? All two hour chunks of training or no? Bring them all together in forums and let them vent and then learn. Or something including both. This project can be accomplished via individual analysis interviews and document reviews, but increased costs and cycle times. I started doing this team thing of analysis and design because I got so frustrated. I got burned so severely in training development projects. I'd go to somebody, get all their input. Go to the next person, get all their input. Get a third person's input and more. Write it all up. This person recognized a third of what I said, but the rest of it wasn't theirs. Where did this stuff come from? That's not what I told you, guy. Uh, I was integrating. <laughs> and I can only lose. Eventually, after I was writing a video script, it took me seven iterations of a video script. I finally got all, this, all these key players in the room and forced them through a process to decide what phrases will we use and not use. There's all kinds of stuff like that, Mickey Mouse stuff. But it was showstoppers. Well, I brought them all together and I made them decide. And then I went forward and I wrote the next iteration of this script up and I was done with it. It was wonderful. So I learned that if I, forced, if I had a process to force collaboration among the key stakeholders, 
oh, I'd be done a lot quicker. It took more of their individual time to participate in that process, but it reduced the overall cycle time tremendously. There was virtually no rework once we did it right. There was some, but we minimized it, which is the goal. Well, roles and responsibilities, there's one that you'll be adding to the list here because it's not on this, this, these slides, but the training professionals, okay, we should basically organize our customers into these other teams and we'll be this team, we're the training folks, we gotta keep ourselves clear in terms of what our roles and responsibilities are, but we'll do the whole thing. But we wanna create a steering team of stakeholders. What's a stakeholder? Somebody's gonna come out of the woodwork six months from now and stop you cold. Find out who they are now and engage them on the front end of this process here and run the gauntlet with them three, four times if you have to, but get it all out now. So you'll reduce your cycle time and your cost for rework because they'll force you to do rework. You're recognizing some of what I'm talking about, huh? Um, so basically you want the steering team to actually own this. The highest levels, feasible, desirable, whatever's appropriate, and that depends on the nature of the project. So they want to review, critique the planning for this. That's how we're going to go do it. That's when we're going to be done. This is who's going to be involved. They should basically hold all of that. The participants and all the rest of the teams, they should identify who they are. They should be players that they've named so that they trust the input. Therefore, they'll trust the output because they'll never have time to look at the output and assess it in great detail. So if they can't do that, if they won't do that because they don't have time to do that, how do we structure the process so that they're going to love it anyway? because so-and-so told them and they were involved in the process in the first place and they all love it and so everybody's fired up. That's what you want. The analysis team or teams, depending on what the scope of your project might be, we've done these for an entire company, we've done these for not even a whole job, and it works. So the analysis team can be composed of, composed of these subject matter experts, master performers, novice performers, management and supervisors. They'll provide the input. Again, they own the content. I own the process. I've got charts to fill out. They own the content. If I write it down incorrectly, they get to change it. It's theirs. Whether I like it or not, whether I know for sure that they are wrong, I write it down because they own the content. We'll figure out what's wrong later on when we go implement. Then the design team. If you've got a bunch of analysis teams who are identifying, here's the job, here's the knowledge and skills required, Here's our assessments of, your exist of the existing training. Basically, the design team can then design around the existing training that's acceptable and create a design that's, that's valued by the customer, that's feasible for their real world situation. There's another team that we would add on here, and that's an implementation planning team. If the steering team doesn't take that on themselves, we want them to set up an implementation planning team. Depending on who these people are on the steering team, the scope of how many things need to be prioritized, it may not be feasible to expect them to do that and we'll want them to hand pick an implementation planning team that'll say this out of the 5,000 is priority number one and here's priority number 5,000 and everything in between. And so if you wanna go down to the priority number 100, here's the, here's the tab, here's the resources required. If you wanna to go to priority number 1,000, here's the resource implications of that. And all that stuff is cooked up by people from the customer organization as facilitated by the training folks. So we own again the process, they own the content. Pros and cons for the team approach. As in everything, there's downside and upsides to it. Pros is basically the broad-based support you'll get. <clears throat> if they all love it, and this always happens, I can give you a whole list of references, they all love this stuff, it makes wonderful sense to them. They'll own the content. It takes less calendar time to do this, you'll get more diverse inputs in the design hopefully resulting in a more robust end product. Robust means when the world changes on us, we minimize the costs and implications, impacts to us because our design was robust and more easily adaptable to the new stuff. It is a proactive team process. It fits within all the quality, quality stuff and participative management kinds of things and empowering people to make decisions and call the shots. And it'll fit with strategy-driven strategy planning approaches because you can link now to what the business strategies are calling for. The business calls out these are the new important critical things here. We can basically focus on just those and deal with the high important stuff later. And then the important stuff after that, and the medium important stuff after that, and hopefully then we find something else to do with our time before we get to the low important stuff. The quality is dependent on the membership of the team. Garbage in, garbage out, good stuff in, good stuff out. You got to give me your master performers, not just 
fourth tier in the mastery performer scheme. Because if you do that, I'll give you a fourth tier quality curriculum architecture design project. It's a business decision, cough up your best people or suffer the consequences, like in all things. <clears throat> Analysis and design are never complete 100% perfectly in team meetings due to the time constraints. The design doesn't give you anything that's perfect. It gives you something that's real good, but it's not perfect. It's not 100% complete. It's not totally accurate. And you'll find out what's wrong when you go put it in place, like they do in the rest of the world. <clears throat> all those designs on paper, when you go build them and they you go fit them in and retrofit things, you find out what you've got to rework. But hopefully you've done it in a smarter way that reduces those aggravations and costs and time. Con the uh, analysis data and design specifications are not detailed enough so that you can say, here's a mod spec, go develop it. No, you still got to go back and do analysis design in a focused area where a lot of stuff has already been done and you're building off of a platform of analysis and design information. You start from there. You don't start from ground zero. This team process requires a very skilled facilitator. They got to understand human performance technology. They have to un understand instructional technology. They have to understand something about training delivery systems. They have to be a good group process facilitator. I think they have to be a driver like me. All right, there are, these are the key outputs. The first four are from analysis. The last four are from design phase. We segment the target audience and we know something about them. Where are they? How many numbers of them are there going to be? How, over five years, how many will there be? Are they, we dealing with onesies and twosies? Or are we dealing with thousands and thousands? Are they all in one big building or are they distributed across the globe? These are the kinds of things that will affect our design decisions of how we're going to deploy our products, how we're going to organize our products. From there, for each target audience, we can build a performance model. Or for a group of target audiences, we can build one performance model. From there, we can systematically derive knowledge and skills and put them in an inventory, a master inventory for the entire company so that we begin to see visibility, what's shareable, where are project management skills required, where is creativity required. Not in the finance department where they're building the 10K for the Security Exchange Commission. <laughs> Creative people need not apply. Because the fines are, the cost of nonconformance there is sufficient that we don't want creative people in that area of the company. Put them in marketing. Training, ex existing training assessments, once we've derived all the knowledge and skills required to support performance, we can take a look at the existing training and figure out what really is good stuff that should be retained for our future. Long term, maybe short term, we'll use it for a while, then we'll throw it away, or we'll use it as source material to build the, the better stuff. So where are we starting from? So the process is intended to embrace all of the training that exists that is either great or good but we can basically start getting rid of the bad stuff and we can start identifying where all the overlaps are and where the gaps are. From there in the design process, we, we take the knowledge and skill matrix, if you will, is basically contains the bill of materials for the entire training system. Those are all the knowledge and skills we would expect to see covered in the training system. Not that we're going to bring all the piece parts to the marketplace. We're going to decide which ones we really can afford and which ones are worthy to bring. But we basically we can design module specs for them all. Because if you don't build the training, it's unstructured OJT, because still people need to learn how to, that stuff to do the job. That's what the process tells us. The knowledge and skills are required to do the job. They'll learn by hook or crook, or we'll basically, it'll be learning by design versus learning by chance. Then we can inventory all that stuff, because it'll get complicated. We can arrange those modules into our training event specs. These are the final products, and we can put them on curriculum paths for people to now consider as they plan their way through training. Any questions so far before I'm going to go into each of the phases and talk about each one of those a little bit more specifically? Yes, Andy. Um, on that last page that you had up, you start talking about performance model and then you go into knowledge and skills. Yes. Is that performance model based on a conference with basically measuring skills and knowledge and skills standards, things like that? Yes. Which then drives knowledge and skills. Right. Okay. Basically, we've stolen, oh, excuse me, benchmark from Gilbert and Rumler. Those of you who are familiar with those two characters. And uh, this goes back. 15, 16, 17 years, but basically that's it. We'll, we'll show you the performance model and what we mean by that and how we actually organize that look of performance. And that's one, of my, one of my concerns about making that point now is there was a real move for a little while to say, hey, what skills are needed? And they kind of missed the job thing. Yeah. yeah. Basically, you can go after generic, uh, com the whole competency movement has generated a lot of those kinds of lists. Yeah. But I'm it's sure. almost the same as our task analyses, which were just as bad, which were basically, I don't know, alpha-ordered tasks. Not structured in some way that looked like, 
But the quality movement then started doing all these business processes, so now we can anchor across that because there's something here that shows the process. It's not just a task that floats in air, it's a task that's in that process, and maybe it's the same in that process. So we'll, we'll, what we need to do is we need to create a structure of our world and basically boil it all down to where here's that part of the process, here's the human performance inside the process. Because all we're trying to do, of course, is reduce the human variability in the process. Everybody else has worked on the non-human stuff, all the materials and equipment and process specs. This first stage is really critical because it's wiring into the politics of the situation, engaging your customer. Either you do this right and you'll be glad for it, or you do this poorly and you'll suffer for it, suffering at different levels of severity. The goal validated consensus of the need to conduct the project with the steering team. I conduct these projects, meet with the steering team. At the end, I say, so you should shut this project down or what? I'm a conf confrontational kind of guy. So I think you should shut this project down if you, unless you can figure out that there's really a business need for doing this. And of course, I'm an outside consultant and they don't expect that from me, so that's a... But I want them to think about that. Is there really a worthy business need? Why are we doing this? Why now? Why shouldn't we be doing something else with the money? Buy laptops for the sales force. Do something. Other training things. Why this one? Because if there really is a need, then I'll get a lot more support, and maybe they have to talk about the needs, and maybe they see the needs a little bit differently, and I want them to start talking about, is this really worthwhile? Because I'm going to ask them to resource this with their best people, people that they don't want to let go of. So they have to convince themselves that, yeah, we need to do this. So establishing that ownership is part of this. Beginning to manage their expectations. This is how it'll happen. This is the implications of all that. If you don't like that, let's replan now today on day one versus day 47 when you say, gee, if I'd known there was going to be these two and three day meetings, guy would have never done this. You've got to scope the project, make sure everybody understands the boundaries. It's just as important to understand what the project isn't going to cover as what it is going to cover. I've been burned on a lot of these things, so I'm sorry if I'm a little adamant about some of this. <clears throat> Negotiate a plan of action. This is the project plan. This is exactly how we're going to slog through the project. Here's the milestones. Here's the review points. Here are the outputs. So we want to gain commitment for all the resources required to conduct this thing because we need the best resources the company has. We don't need them forever. We need them for a short duration, but we do need them. This is a lot of the same kind of stuff. We're going to get an approved project plan out of this phase, and we'll have an orientation presentation for all of them, and this is basically it. You can draft a project plan. This is not necessarily in this order. You might, somebody will come to you. They may be the steering team leader. You need a champion, somebody who's well-respected amongst their peers in the stakeholder community, somebody who can actually make things happen, break free the resources, those kinds of things. You need to sell the leader and then have them help you handpick the rest of the steering team members. You need to prepare them, no surprises. They should come to the meeting and shouldn't be hearing about the project and all that for the very first time. You need to forewarn them. The rule, no surprises. We don't like surprises, they don't like surprises. In fact, the first meeting, they all kind of understand what this is about, but now they can begin to deal with the issues that they perceive. Not, what is this, but now that I've thought about this for a while, guy, I have a concern about this and that. How do we? <clears throat> that's, the, that's where I wanted them to get to and talk it amongst themselves. So a project plan should be detailed. We training folks that can do task analyses, we ought to be able to write up a detailed project plan. It's kind of the thing in reverse. <clears throat> but stuff like this, project purpose, 25 words or less, why are you doing this, why are you doing it now? Background, a little bit more depth on that. Scope, what does it include, what does it not include, et cetera. And then detailed planning charts. It says, task one is to go do such and such, and who in the of the people that are going to be involved in this are going to do what and when is it starting and ending. So this is a project in control. But the first phase in wiring in the politics and engaging the customer, getting the right customer group together as a steering team is critical. The wrong group is the kiss of death. Phase two, analysis. There are four types of analysis. We'll be talking about all four. But we want to analyze the performance within the project scope, develop these performance models, and identify performance-based training requirements, these knowledge and skill things. We want to identify knowledge and skills at a fairly discrete level, although you'll see later on when I talk about this a little bit more, that it's at all sorts of different levels. But we want to link each one of these knowledge and skills back to performance models so that we understand this performance, this knowledge and skills required to support what kind of performance? And gather some other data for each one of those things. But Performance analysis establishes effective work performance as the criterion for training, 
not some terminal objective that comes from who knows where, or some enabling objective that comes from somewhere else, they should all be driven off the performance model. Produce this output, the measure this way by performing these tasks and playing in the same box, same sandbox with these other cast of characters in the team thing. <clears throat> all the analysis data can be generated again by, by, the, by a team or an individual process. We've had to do them uh, all different ways. Basically, we do a two or three day analysis team meeting on, a, say, a, a function. We might have uh, electrical engineering or mechanical engineering or marketing or product management or the entire sales thing, the management and the sales force and sales support people, a chunk like that of performers. Basically, in about three days, you can crank out all the stuff I'm going to talk about. But there's some things you do beforehand, the target audience data. Who are they? Where are they? What are the job titles? Where are they growing? You can do that outside the meeting, hopefully pre-meeting. You build a performance model of the knowledge and skills category list and the matrices in the meeting. And there's another analysis output here that should be on this list and it's not, and it is the existing training assessments. That can be done in, one of, in this phase or the next phase. So <clears throat> this may look very pre-prescribed and it is, but it's got some flexibility. If you don't do it in this phase, you can do it in the last, next phase, but in, a, but in the front end of that phase. This is just a smaller snapshot of that other picture I showed you before. But I'm going to walk you through some examples of these things and demystify this. Target audience data sheet. They don't have to look like this. This is just one that we did for a client and we just changed some of the names on it. But basically it was a material handler. It said the total population, the turnover rate, so how many in the next five years, the number of locations, the average number of locations. We could see from this immediately 7.5 people by the time we train them and they have this this 12% uh, turnover, we're going to be dealing with training onesies and twosies at each location. Hmm. Let's not build big classroom things centralized for that because they probably won't send a materials handler to Mecca, wherever the training Mecca happens to be. <clears throat> what do we know about their ages? You might put sex, you know, what do we know about them? What do we know about our customers? Like any marketeer, you've got to understand what you're going to do with this data, so you go collect it, but where do they come from? What do we know? What can we assume? Look at this, 80% of these people come locally, they're not internal transfers, they're not external with hires with experience, they're 80% here, look at, the, look at the age, they're all young. Train them on computers, what about these people here? Well, <clears throat> hand hold them through the computer thing or something, I don't know. But what, you know, because we can bring a training, a learning event to the marketplace here, what do we know about that marketplace? Well, we're not going to hit everybody squarely with, because we've done this analysis, we'll hit them better as a group, just like anybody that brings a product to the market. They never get exactly what I want, but I get a lot. And they'll get my business if they have more in it than anybody else. And all they have to do is beat their competitors. They don't have to meet my needs exactly. They just have to beat their competitors in meeting my needs. That's all. It doesn't have to be perfect. Determine what you're going to do with this data first before you start collecting it. A good rule of thumb. There's the performance model here in the corners on your next page here. So you'll be able to actually see it. The data points typically in a performance model are what's the mission statement? <coughs> Not the wordsmith, beautiful, last forever mission statement, but just something to help get a team going. What are the major accomplishments or areas of responsibility or areas of performance or major duty areas? There's a whole bunch of competing terms for equivalent thing. But within that, what are the outputs produced? What are the task performs? What are the various roles and responsibility if we're going after more than one job? What are the measures and standards if possible? They typically don't exist except unless the regulatory community has imposed them on us, then we know what standards are. Typical performance deficiencies. So if this is ideal performance above this line here, well, then what's really going on? What's typically not happening per the measures that we've established? What are some of the causes? Are there environmental supports missing? Like they don't have the data they need to do it, so they're guessing all the time, and that's why they're poor performers. Or they don't even have the knowledge and skills to do this, or we've misselected people. We take people who can't deal with ambiguity and put them in a job full of chaos and ambiguity. <clears throat> we take people who can't take rejection and we make them salespeople? You can build a performance model for an organization, a function, a process, a job, a task. You can come at it from any angle that you want. This is what one example looks like. This is not exactly like the list I showed you before. They are always different. The first two columns are ideal performance. The next two are actual performance. It says for the work process phase, Roman numeral number one at the top, component assembly kit preparation. This was the first of eight steps in a process to build composite materials for military aircraft to make them light enough to land on a 
on an aircraft carrier at night, built by the cheapest bidder. <clears throat> Which is a scary thought in the middle of the night when you're a pilot, I would imagine. I've never been one, so I don't know. The output's produced in the measures and standards, so it's an updated job order, it's complete, it's accurate. All right, we've not done a lot of detailed analysis here to find out what do you mean by completeness and accuracy. We've got enough here to give us some visibility about what this is all about to decide if this is a priority or not. If when we need to get the more details, we'll go get them. But if this, again, is the last priority, we don't need that today. What are the tasks performed to produce those outputs? This was a very interesting thing. This, uh, this, this customer of ours lost a $5 billion project with the Department of Defense. Because after two years of building these parts, they had zero yield. These weren't the toilet seats. <clears throat> the, here's was our clue when we were doing this. This was interesting. We knew we were taking on this project because they were in big, big, big trouble. They had to train these people. They had to produce some products that were actually OK. Pick up the cutting pattern. Review the match parts list of job order there in the task perform. Ah, typical performance deficiencies. Materials gathered don't match the job order. Why? Job order numbers will specify the wrong number. Oh, boy. <laughs> so by the time I'm done with this eight-phase step process here, and I got about $10,000 of material and labor built in this part, and it's absolutely no good, zero yield, it's all back on step one where it all falls apart. You know, the workforce knew this. Their immediate management knew this. This is not a surprise to the people in the room giving us the content, because they own the content. Conversion charts are incomplete. It's a DE. The people know. They could do it right if they'd only called for the right materials. But you tell somebody to take an aircraft wing and build a uh, car with it, it's not going to be a car. So a bunch of those kinds of things came in. Now, what we use, we get this information here, because if we're going to build training, we understand it's not just teach them one, two, three, and it's easy as that. It's teach them one, two, three, and then here's the, all the real world difficulties you're going to face and how we can contend with that. That's what training should address, not the rote step-by-step -step thing. That's the easy part. Write that down on a piece of paper. I'll go from there. Teach me how to deal with all this stuff. How do I deal with incomplete conversion charts? Well, you go to the file. And then what if it's not in the file? Then you go to the engineers. Well, if you don't do the engineers, then you set that job order aside and don't add a nickel of value to that product because the shareholders would like you for that. Your immediate management would be pressured by a delivery schedule of bad stuff. So once we understand performance, and we would have eight charts of like that defining the job down to some level of detail. We use that as a means to derive knowledge and skills. We will use these categories to further help us organize our data collection process. What product knowledge do you need when you're doing that first chunk of the job? What tools and equipment do you need when you're doing that first chunk of the job? What are the records and reports and forms and documents that you have to contend with when you're doing that first part of the job? What are the external regulations? What are the internal policies and procedures? What are the management supervisory skills? What are the interpersonal skills? It's inherently complex to do work. So when you got a, a list like that, basically then you can go get a lot of data points Things like this, like is the knowledge and skills on one of those tools, selection versus training, do we, do we hire them in that with that competency? Or do we have to train them? How important is it? Is it difficult to learn? How much do we have to go to awareness, knowledge, or skill depth? A little bit, a lot more, hands-on? What's the volatility of the content here? How often will this change? I will design it differently and deploy it differently if I understand its volatility so I can reduce my future costs my future life cycle costs of the product line. These knowledge and skill matrices, here's an example from that previous performance model chart. These are the tools and equipment and machinery. Roman numeral one is right here. In that, you use the broad goods ply cutter. <clears throat> it's the only place you use it. When you train on that, it's to do that job, that job alone. That's where the performance anchor is. How important is it? High. What phase of the training? A, B, C, early, later on, way later. That's all that means. It's an arbitrary cut until we figure out a better way to look at that. Immediately, the depth. Now, they said awareness. Uh, that's not right. Uh, the minutes thing, we knew that this client was going to develop this training immediately after this because of their issue. And so we were gathering other information on this also. Let me back up one slide. So all these bullets are basically a varied set of columns that you could have had on that knowledge and skill matrices. So we knew we were, this was important. We were going to develop a lot of this training. We just wanted to find out the relative importance of piece parts of it. 
but there were a lot of information that we just were going to assume. Yeah, we're doing this training thing here. We got $5 billion program. This wasn't the only thing that caused that to get shut down, but it was a major thing because that aircraft was 2,000 pounds overweight still. The knowledge and skill linkage to the performance model ensures that the, that the knowledge and skill is directly related to the work. It's not nice to know. You won't find history of composites in any one of these lists because you cannot find, you cannot tell me, and I own the process, and part of the process is me being able to challenge content like that. So exactly where does that help me do what? And it goes into one of those big things in the sky where we, <laughs> so the person takes it back, never mind. It provides specific direction to those who will ultimately develop the training because we've got this data that says, hey, you develop this chunk of the training and look at this area of performance and make sure the content that you create covers this. Do your detailed analysis and design and this, scope this way. It also <clears throat> helps us understand by linking it back to the performance model. If we understand performance, we'll understand what's really critical in performance. We don't have to get the frequency count and the importance thing individually on all these piece parts. We have a holistic model of performance we can tell. And since we're engaging our customers and they're calling a lot of these shots, they will direct us to get the important stuff out, not the stuff that looks doable or just doable. Okay, so if you've got this kind of data here, can you do anything else with it? Yeah, you can create a selection system around it because you all understand all these knowledge and skills. Do you train on them all? Let's say, let's maybe hire for some of those and we don't have to face the training bill. New hire orientation stuff, yeah, career planning. If you understood the performances at various succeeding levels in an organization and understood the knowledge and skill requirements, you could figure out the deltas, you could, you could basically d support your succession <coughs> planning process or career management process for those of us who are not at the executive level. Same thing. You can build a qualification certification system. We just built one for the Alaska Pipeline for 18 different types of operators and maintenance technicians basically running their own entire little world up there in the, on the tundra. And basically they used all this performance model knowledge and skill data to create a specification for 2200 qualification instruments so they could prove to the Bureau of Land Management that they knew what they were doing, which was in question. And they could then build the training, their curriculum architecture design, around supporting that certification thing because the cost of nonconformance for them would have been shut the pipeline down until you get this straight. And that was going to be very, very costly. Basically, also, you see some of that, uh, that real performance stuff in there, the ideal performance and then what's actually happening. <coughs> While the methodology we're using is a quick and dirty this is what's going on, this is what we think is the cause. We know for a fact that those, that's not root cause analysis, that doesn't say for sure this is the problem. We just have a hint that there's a problem in this area, but that might also be a hint for other quality improvement, performance improvement, critical action teams, whatever you call them, to go tackle that thing and deal with some of these issues. Any questions about analysis before I move into design? So what does ideal performance look like? How, and, you know, so outputs are produced, and that's, we're behavioral a second, we're really results-oriented folks first. So what are those outputs and what are the measures of that? And a lot of this stuff can come off of process models that are coming out of process mapping exercises, but you see these things where they're basically information flow maps versus, you know, so you've got to figure out, derive then. So where's the human interface and what are they doing? So you build that into a human performance model. And then you basically can identify, well, if those are the measures of performance at the output level, where are we typically not getting those? And that's where we start. So that's where we, how we articulate deficiencies, because otherwise you could do it at the task level and you get bogged down. Since we're doing this in the meeting, you have constrained time, you have to really push the process and you have to have it structured. So we're using outputs. If the output is okay, the performance must be okay. We may not like their behaviors, but if they're actually, you know, if you have an instructor that stands on their head all day long and the class aces the test, and in the next room the instructor's doing all the platform skills just right and everybody gets a B, 
who should you go mess with? I talk to that instructor about not standing on his head or something, you know, <laughs> benchmark the guy next door. But uh, yeah, it's establishing the performance so that we can derive the knowledge and skills and we'll have those two sets of data and when the priorities are decided, we'll basically go in and slice out and do more micro analysis and then micro uh, of performance and knowledge and skills and that'll allow us to go do more micro design kinds of things. <clears throat> the one thing that's not really talked about in that last one is then ex assessing all the existing training which, depending on how much you got, can be a very nightmarish kind of a thing. It can be very political. You know, I understand you guys come from different training organizations. You probably have some overlapping content in your product line currently. So somebody's got to sort through all that stuff. There's more than enough work here to sort through it, clean it up, and fill in the gaps. And when things do need to be different because of local needs that are different, we might title them the same, but when we look at them closer, they're different, and we need to step up to that and understand. It, we fooled ourselves. It said project management, both groups. It's very different. The same thing would not fit. We have to have a way to, to figure some of that out better and have a way to actually correct ourselves when we were wrong, which we will be. The design phase. We have to establish some curriculum architecture design criteria with the customers and with the training providers. So what do you want us to do and not want us to do? I've had clients that said, when you build these training events, make sure that they're all five days long. Why? Because they're flying people in from all over the country to Chicago, and basically they don't want somebody to fly in for a one-day training event ever because the airplane ticket was too expensive. So that was their rule. The other clients who said, everything should be in two-hour modules, two-hour chunks. So when it's raining out, we can bring people into the shed and train them and everything in between. Some of them want something that's more, more flexible, just in time, which means we can't have a lot of instructor-led, group-paced kinds of things. We need to get away from that. And when we know we need it to facilitate learning, to be more effective with learning, we can use that also. Or when we want to bring groups together in a forum so they can dialogue, you know, high touch within all this high tech stuff, because there's a need for that too. We can do some of those kinds of things. Hey, yes. <coughs> Could you, um, and maybe you're going to go into more detail, but on the create a five-tier module inventory structure, yeah. that's still a little bit fuzzy for me. Could you describe what you mean by that again? I mean, I'm, going, I'm going to come back to that, but, uh, and I'll, I'll explain that here in the next few slides, okay. if that's okay. Good. You'll find out that I get into more detail than you really want on most of this. Well, let me finish that. All right, so you've got to create this inventory structure, five tier, it's arbitrary, you can have a 17 tier, you can do it with letters, it doesn't really matter, you've got to embrace the concept to get it organized. No different than if you went into the factory and looked at the warehouse, you want the materials uh, area to be organized. So basically you want to know, I want to go find the wood screws versus the metal screws, don't make me search through everything, just let me know where it is. Because if, if I'm a designer, I'm going to design something, I want to build a little prototype or something, you got to organize that so it's easier for me to slog through all that stuff. And that's all that thing does. So we have to create that because as we create these modules, we have to have to do something with a number with them because by the time we get to about another 150, we're going to realize that we've got this big pile here of all sorts of different stuff here and it's not going to be easy to work with. So we have to have a scheme in order to organize it before we even start creating this stuff. That's all. Defining our modules then and sorting them into this inventory structure, which is just a temporary numbering thing. Then we can configure modules into training events, and then we can build these paths. And I'll draw something up with the flip chart here at the end of this section of the presentation to describe a little bit more detail about that. This gives you some. My fear with these, this chart that's in each one of the phases is that it looks very rote. That is step four there, yep. But step four could be done at step two point or step six. There's more flexibility here than this might suggest, but this is but one way to go through it. So if you have a design team, you've got to sit down with them and talk to them about what this is all about, orient them, bring them up to speed, find out what it is that they want, or tell them what the steering team told you they wanted and didn't want out of all this thing, because it can happen in different places. Create or review your five-tier inventory scheme, because you may have cooked that up before this design meeting. In fact, you may have done this last year when you did the first curriculum architecture design project, and you're on 12 now, and so you're building off this base. Basically, you've got to cluster the knowledge and skills from the analysis phase into modules. That's all you're doing. You're clustering into modules. And then you're going to cluster modules into events. And then you're going to put events on paths. You're going to have to contend with criteria. Stuff like this. 
typical design criteria. This isn't all, <clears throat> and this isn't the list. This is just the kinds of things that I've, I've been given. And at the bottom here, it says, sometimes the criteria established are contrary. Uh, actually, that's always, each time. No escaping it. So there's criteria that might come from the training supply side and then the training customer side. And there's, there's criteria that could re related to the development of training, because we're going to do design things that will have downstream implications in terms of development, delivery, and administration. If I have a highly modularized curriculum, I have a higher administrative cost because I'm administrating more piece parts. Now, to meet the customer's needs to be as flexible as possible, I'll drive to a higher level of modularity. But can I afford it? So I probably meet someplace in the middle. Maybe closer to the customer side, maybe closer to my side. I don't know what's appropriate. So it's just things like this that customers are typically looking at. I was just trying to demystify the thing. I usually call this quick market picture design criteria, concepts, considerations, and constraints. Okay, so tell me, tell me how to win. That's all I want. All right, this inventory structure. I got all these little chunks of training that I've pulled together. I've taken all these knowledge and skills from analysis, and I've sat through this very tedious process with a team of people who understand the job. And I've said, if I pull these knowledge and skills together and clump them into a module, does that make sense? Is some of this content volatile and the rest of it not volatile? Because I don't want to do that. I'll have to segregate those into two modules. So I'm chunking content into a logical series of sub-assemblies, training modules that basically will afford me more flexibility for the future. If I chunk it out this way, I can take this one chunk and I can serve the needs of sales and marketing, R&D, and the finance folks. Okay, that sounds like a good idea to do that. I would want to do that. But then they might say, but then everybody, that's just the generic portion. Everybody needs a, their own spin on it. Ah, I'll create three separate spin modules to attach to that one here, and that's how I'll meet their needs. Probably the same as a manufacturer putting a different faceplate on the old product and you think it's now new. And it's just built for me because it says for guy on the front. <clears throat> and Ray says for Ray. And his looks a lot like mine. Okay, tier one modules. And this is kind of arbitrary, but this works for me, so take it for what it's worth. Uh, but experiment also. Tier one, orientations to the environment demystifying the organization. If I'm a cog in the great big machinery of the company, where's my cog, where's my machinery, what are, what's the functionality of our portion of this? How does this fit in the whole thing? <clears throat> Should I be going out to Kinko's or do we have a print shop inside? You know, demystify this organization for me. I got a lot of resources and everybody's got different charges. What are they, this organization, what's their mission? What's their purpose? How are they organized? Who's who? If I need to call them, give me a number. All very conducive to self-paced kinds of things, electronic delivery, you want to do it that way because it's probably a moving target and the cheapest way to do that is keep it electronic and don't put it in paper ever. Tier two is what we call task overview training. It demystifies the task, teaches nobody anything about how to do it. It teaches you what it's all about. It's the same content off the performance model and knowledge and skill matrix. It says, here's how we look at the work. It's chunked out this way. There's a component kit assembly in the previous example, that might be one chunk of the job. Guy, the module would tell me, these are the outputs, this is how we measure them, these are the tasks that are performed, here's who's doing what, if there's different roles involved. Here's the typical problems you'll run into. Here's the knowledge and skills you'll need to do this. Here's the training events where you'll get those. Whew, it got scary until that last part, but here's the training that I'll get to help me do that, okay. So basically that's it, job A would be up there, B and C, and uh, the numbering thing, forget that, but, but basically there may be three parts to A's job, three parts to B's job, and C's got more parts to it, so we're demystifying it in a segmented fashion. <coughs> Tier three are the supporting knowledge and skills. This is typically the biggest portion of a curriculum. This is where you can buy a lot of training rather than make it. Tier four and five is how to. Just like the, how, the task overviews, this is actually how to do it, where we integrate things. So if you'll imagine on this example here, um, let's say that uh, this, is sale, this is sales and this is uh, engineering and this is finance and there's a part of their job where they have to use spreadsheets. So we have a spreadsheet training thing in here. There's different policies and procedures. Sales is building a territory plan using a spreadsheet. 
R&D is doing uh, R&D budget, and finance is doing something else. And we know that, that as they go from this task overview to their task completion module, they're going to get some other discrete pieces of knowledge and skill. Like here's the policy and procedure on budgets. Here's the spreadsheet thing. Here's uh, uh, how to use tap into a, uh, an existing data system that we have. OK, roll that all together and now put together your budget. Integrate all those knowledge and skill components and now do the work. Now, normally we just have the spreadsheet course and everybody can figure it out from themselves because we've got smart people on the payroll. Well, if they had just the, just the spreadsheet thing and we gave them just minimally the performance model, they might have a better and easier time figuring it out for themselves. But they've not, we've not seen a lot of success with people, people figuring out how to bridge the gap from generic training to real world applications <coughs> and do it successfully. We should build those training aids for them. Yes? Just to clarify, this isn't a completely top-down approach where you have to start up here and go straight through. It is no. iterative, prerequisite, prioritized phase. Here is just the courses in a structure. Yeah, and these aren't even the courses. These are the modules. Right. I mean, this, this equivalency here of tier three is the best one here. All right, here's all the electrical stuff for the car, because this is just the product components. This is an inventory scheme here so we can get into the materials lockers and get the stuff, and get in there and get out of there in a hurry. So here's all my electrical components. Here's my windshields. Here's the radio. We only have one for all the cars. You know, and here's where we've got flexibility. Here's the different brake systems, because we've got some very, 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 very uh, fast engines, and they'll need bigger brakes. The faster the engine, the bigger the brakes. That's the general design rule here at Car, Cars R Us. Um, <clears throat> At least I hope they do that. So then we take all those knowledge and skills, we bundle them the modules, that's the inventory scheme where we're going to keep them, and we can basically, and there, these module spec sheets have different appearances depending on what the client's need is and what they want to put on it. But we, we say here's, here's this title, we don't have a title on here. What's the preliminary delivery strategy? What's the depth of coverage? This one says we're going to be group-paced classroom. It's not a lab, no Bunsen burners, no computers. Any conference room in America will do. Depth of coverage, go to a knowledge, we're not going to skill. It's 25% would be the length, is it in, in hours or pages? Some of these things have fallen off here. Implementation planning, high, medium, low. Is it a make or buy? We can buy this one. That's the good news. It'll go on curriculum pass for who? Just this group. The preliminary content listing, not all inclusive, not terminal objectives. This is just content so that some customer can look at this and say, nah, low priority, don't build this one. Or this is my number one thing. Unfortunately, maybe the other stakeholders on the steering team don't think it's the number one thing. They may say this is the number 10 thing, okay? So that all sorts out. What we do with that steering team is rather than have our customers cry at us and put their demands on us one at a time, we form them into a little union and have them scream in unison to us with what they want so we can win. Make them do all that hard decision making to figure out what was really going to get done first, second, third, and not at all. We are in that decision currently, I bet, and you can't win that decision making mode. You can only lose. So these are module, module spec, not a design. So it's a preliminary design spec to establish content boundaries. will require validation because it's probably wrong. And the content's probably not complete. Somewhere we went wrong. We know that about the process. It's not intended to be that. It's to set boundary conditions. It's to pull performance model stuff and knowledge and skill stuff together and basically help the customer identify, OK, so this module will help people perform what? That's got to be visible to them. Otherwise, they can't prioritize it. The event is just rolling those things together into the product. Okay, this is the car. It's built on these modules. And here's what we have in it. So these are the module numbers, the module titles. Here's the lengths. Here's the availability status. You got this one in place. The rest of them you don't have. Do you want to bring this product to market without the other pieces in place and just go with this piece? Or do you want to add a couple of pieces here for the first uh, version, and then we'll roll out a second version and make it complete later? So there's flexibility here in terms of how we implement. Modules are the architectural building elements of a training curriculum architecture design. And all sorts of different modules here. <coughs> they don't all have to be traditional training kinds of things, even though I got the term training throughout this whole thing. I'll change it to learning at some point. Learning events, learning modules. I'm about ready to do that. I was at NSPI and was told I should do that. So individual training modules or learning modules reconfigured in the varied training events. 
Again, Marketing 101, Engineering 101. I'm sharing. My first costs might go up to build module number one because I have to contend with more audiences. So my first cost for that product, that subassembly, may be higher than if I just did it for marketing. But the leverage that I get on sharing it to deliver it to more audiences, and then if I have to update that, I only have to update it once. I don't have to update all 18 soldering courses at Motorola to get the content squared away. I can update the one, hopefully. So I can, I can increase the shareability. I can reduce my future life cycle cost to be in this business, which should be the goal, I, I think. As long as it's the right products, I ought to be doing this effectively with the resources. I can put them on curriculum paths. Job curriculum paths, team curriculum paths, role curriculum paths, process curriculum paths. But I think most people recognize themselves as people with a job title, with a home room. I'm in engineering, yeah, I'm on all these teams, but I think I'm still an engineer. I haven't seen an engin another engineer in a while, maybe, but... <laughs> so I want to look at the job for an engineer here, and maybe the right kinds of things are on here to help me do my team thing outside the engineering organization, but I'm still an engineer. I still need to... The half-life of my knowledge is too short for my comfort level. Uh, this ought to give me some more understanding of how I'm going to keep myself upgraded, up to date. And then an individual and his or her supervisor can sit down and customize a plan like this. Says, guy, well, you already know this stuff, and you already know this stuff, so, and this isn't required for the job, or, or it is, but it's a lower priority than the other things, so, and I can only afford so much, so here, that's just input to the planning process for consuming training from your customer standpoint. It should be organized in such a way that, uh, um, it can support worst case college new hire coming in. They got more learning to do than anybody else. Internal transfers from another or from another company, they come in with some knowledge and skills, so they ought to be able to start at some, they don't start at the top of the pr thing, they probably start somewhere in the middle. Or they take the company orientation or the functional orientation and then they may skip other things because they came in the door with that stuff. I'm going to the flip chart. The camera's on me. Um, all right, so quick and paths. And basically, one of the things we do in the design meeting is we basically lay out a path. And we arbitrarily say, well, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. And we take these knowledge and skills from our analyses and we put them on little pieces of paper. This is kind of our control methodology in our process. And we cluster these knowledge and skills and we, we create a module and we, and we make a sense that, okay, there's, vol there's no, no volatile and non-volatile. We've got that cleaned up. We kind of understand other target audiences and so we basically got this where we think this is good. It'll support a lot of different people's needs. We don't have extraneous stuff in it that now make it inappropriate for another group. So if we've got this module now, where do we replace it? This is the kind of training content that people need, what, at the beginning of the training cycle, the middle, or the end? And they tell us, and let's just say that oh, that one went there, and we get another one here, and another one here, and another one here. And basically, we go through this process of taking all those knowledge and skill items, clustering them together into modules, putting them a module spec sheet on top of it, giving it a title and a number and all that, because you can tell by the content type what number it will have in the five-tier thing. So you can at least give it the first tier number. So we basically go through this process of doing that, and we decide, we get into this and say, okay, now that we created this one, well, this one's wrong now, so we have to divide that one into two, and now this part goes down here, and you just, it's very iterative, messy, tedious, if you don't like this kind of stuff, stay away from it, process. <clears throat> and we basically get all this stuff together. And we got all the modules, all the sub-assemblies of training, with some understanding of, for the typical target audience member who we've described previously, the worst case scenario, typically for me, is that at the beginning, this kind of training stuff should be on their plate in the middle of their training cycle, and this might be, and we might even be able to say, okay, this is immediate survival skills, first 30 days, ideally before they even took the job, but that never happens. The middle is the next year, and this is the le the, for the rest of their lives. And maybe we just, maybe when we're done here, we say, there's that first phase, this breaks out in a couple phases, that breaks out in the more, and we may end up with the seven phase thing. That can happen too. So our goal here is now to start taking these modules on this path for job A and decide how do we cluster the modules in the training events. So we're clustering. We went from, we were modulizing before, now we're eventizing. So we might say, well, that makes sense. We'll package that all into one deliverable. That's an event now. You sign up for an event. You roll, uh, register at an event. You schedule events. 
if it's a schedulable type of thing, if it's not on demand, and we administrate at the event level. We understand our training at the modular level, we have the training manufacturing folks, but we administrate it and our customers buy it bundled into events. We just understand modularity so we can be more effective and efficient with resources, uh, be more timely in our response to updating things. And so we may have a module that's an event all by itself and stuff like that. And that, So that's the drill. And the design team members from the real world, you know, those engineers or whoever we're dealing with are sitting there critiquing everything you do, asking you to rationalize it. Why are you doing that, guy? It's a training thing. Leave me alone. <laughs> yes? That you were about. Yes, these modules, for example, this might have been module one, welcome to Eli Lilly. Here's our history, the history, here's where the history comes into place. Because history is important sometimes for us to understand. When I went to Motorola and they told us about the history, the, the radio's taken bullets and they still work in World War II and that's why they sold so many when the GIs came back and all that stuff. Oh, I was pumped. And so I could have a, a, a tier, I might have several ones and twos in there. That could have been a three. That could have been my time management, because time is important around here. Guy, manage it well. Um, so I can have all these different module tiers. That's just, an, that's just an arbitrary sorting device. That's like taking your car apart and deciding, OK, let's figure out what the electrical parts are and the fuel parts are and the, wind, the glass versus the metal. You know, that's how you would recognize it if it was all in piece parts and sorted appropriately. But it wouldn't look like the product. This basically just allows us to look at the product and understand the component nature of the product. Again, we're dealing with something that's inherently complex. I apologize, this is inherently complex, but I think appropriately so. <laughs> Implementation planning. All right, now that we've identified all the training that could be, could be, we should be telling people all along, just because we can figure out what could be doesn't mean it should be, okay? That's the drill here. We're not trying to build an empire by calling out all this training, we're going to build all of it. I always tell everybody from day one, if we start building more than 60% of the curriculum, something is probably wrong. I made up the 60%, you figure out your own number. Um, but basically, we should probably be buying laptops for every Salesforce member before we get into that part of this thing, or we should do something else with the money here that can't be right. There is low priority stuff that we can identify that our knowledge and skills that are required to do the job, but if you develop training for them, the return will be negative, and you don't want to do that. So we need to prioritize training modules and or events, because if you do the events, the module priorities pull forward. It depends on which your customer here, what level of this they want to be mucking around in. Establish budgets and personal resource requirements. If you know that you have group-paced classroom training or lab or CBT or self-paced or video-based, and you know historically what your developmental costs are, so you can ratio that if I build eight hours of this or 40 min, uh, an hour of that, I know what that's going to cost me approximately. I can do resource planning based on this curriculum architecture design. Once I have the priorities, I can tell you what the resource implications are. Now, of course, your customers might say, well, no, you know, we really want the 10-pound thing for the five-pound price. The 10-pound training course shoved in a five-pound bag, which means we cover everything about halfway. Um, but here's where you get a chance to basically get way up front of this thing and say, no, it just costs this much to do this. Now, we can do some really garbage training for you cheaper, <laughs> um, but it's, that's a business decision, and if that's what you want to direct us to do, we're not happy with it, but we'll do it. <clears throat> Determine support system requirements. There may, you may not have the infrastructure in place to deploy all this stuff, which means you maybe shouldn't have designed it to be deployed in a manner that's inconducive with your <laughs> environment. And you can develop an implementation plan and assign responsibilities now. You can really get down to, and you can go to various levels on this. You can go beyond development. You can get into delivery. You can get into the whole administrative thing and design everything around this. This is one input to what we call strategic planning for training and development, which is what Ray's book was, was all about. And I got a slide coming up on that in a few minutes. Basically, I, I, earlier I said that I'd like the steering team to set the priorities. I want them to own this. I want them to prioritize it. I want them to look at the dollars. I want them to say, if we go to priority number 1,000, what's it cost us? There's the line. Is that more or less than you were expecting? It's a business decision. Resource it more. If we're not getting down the priority list far enough for you, then you're going to have to put more money to it. It's like building factories. You need more, more space. You've got to put money to it. You just can't pretend that you will make that happen. We'll find the room in there someplace, maybe up on the roof. But 
you want to review this CAD with the steering team or the implementation planning team if they've created one to handle this for them on their behalf. Because if you really got to work, normally in some of these things, the, the number of modules you're looking at and prioritizing may be 100, 200. But I've been in meetings before where we're dealing with 1,200. And the steering team members are a high enough level that I didn't even pretend to ask them. I said, you will want to appoint a steering, uh, an implementation planning team to do this for you. Better get somebody from the CFO organization on here so they can understand the money implications that are coming out, where these numbers come from, so that they have some buy-in that this isn't just phony baloney numbers that the training people cooked up or their customers. So you gotta have your assumptions. What's the cost to develop all the training? What are the planning scenarios? And just crunch the numbers and run several what ifs and let the, let the steering team, those stakeholders, those customer stakeholders and other stakeholders, make some business decisions about what training should be brought to market to support the needs of the business. We believe that priorities for development and acquisition should be done by the customers and not by the training organizations, because how can you know? We might recommend a set of priorities because we're getting visibility about this one chunk of training here is needed by everybody in critical processes, and we've got some insight to that now that we've done all this analysis. We can tell our steering team that, but they still get to make the decision. We can phase our approach to curriculum implementation We'll have missing prerequisites we'll have to deal with. We'll have attempts to build low priority training module content in the high priority training modules. I, as a trainer, a training developer, often felt I'm out there in my real world. And basically, they've not seen one of a training folk for a while, and we're developing some training, so they're trying to get all their training needs met in the one thing that I'm doing, whether it made any sense or not. But hey, it was, the, it was their opportunity, their window as they saw it. I was it. They were trying to force me to take content and put it in here. And if it was peripheral, close but peripheral, they could make a case for it and I couldn't defend that. If I had this blueprint module spec thing, I'd say, yeah, I know your content, it's in module 27433, and it's priority 33, and I'm working on priority number 12 this time. So we'll be back again, if that priority holds. If it doesn't hold, it's because the people in your world said it didn't hold. It's their priority, not the training organizations. Again, I'm out of the decisions where I can't win. So your implementation plan via develop and acquisition, you'll have overall, overall budget parameters, module priorities, event priorities, make buy strategies per module. You should have a development process. What is your instructional systems development process? Your development acquisition project plans, management control strategies and plans could all be part of this kind of a thing. Now, we have a methodology for doing custom course development slash acquisition, because we can buy rather than develop. And we have a very structured process for doing that. Everybody's got their own. They all kind of works, or at least most of them do. And uh, ours is basically built so that if you do a CAD, the data that you have slides right into the development process. There's no going back to ground zero. At NSPI this year, uh, my, one of my clients at Hewlett Packard won uh, for best instructional product. And she had nine and a half weeks to create training. They were, they were uh, centralizing 11 different order fulfillment sites to one site. Basically, 75 to 90 percent of the people would be brand new, never did the job before. This was, they were going to implement this with all the dealer orders. The dealers are most of their orders. The risk was so high, they had scared themselves when they figured out what they had done to themselves. And they had to do this training in a big hurry. We came in and did the curriculum architecture design thing, and they built all the piece parts. They had something like 11 or 12 course developers. Daryl Sink uh, was the had the course development projects out in California, and he brought in a bunch of freelancers, and my client spent all of her time making sure content didn't migrate from one module to the next, because a good developer of training would say, this content is incomplete. They need all these other things, too. I will optimize this course, and sub-optimize the total design and build in all the redundancy that we were trying to strip out in the first place. So she spent all of her time just making sure that they were brought up to speed on that. And they weren't up to speed on that because they were in such a hurry that no one knew how much training there was to be developed. No one had hired anybody, and it was just, it had to happen so quickly for her, but it worked. It gave her a control mechanism. And that's what she would say about what this gave to her. It gave her something. They prioritized what training they would bring. She was able to control all the development, and they had all this concurrent development efforts going on. And when they went to put it together and assemble it, like all those car manufacturers bring that together, hoping you get a real car that works out of that, it worked for her. And of course, Daryl Singh, former president of NSPI, could write up the application so he could win the award, and that's how he won the award. <laughs> hey, if you've been involved in the society, you know how to do that. You know what hoops to jump through and how to write it up. 
Now, if you're doing a lot of this kind of a thing, this is the book, Ray's book. He, got, uh, he won an award at NSBI last year for it, uh, Best in uh, Structural Communication. But if the, re the required resources to put this in place will be extreme, and you have to buy many people into this, because if this is going to change everything and how you do it and how you deploy it and all those kinds of things, you need to get your handle on that. There's a book. You've got copies of it. It'll take you through a whole bunch of planning exercises to figure it all out. But it'll address those kinds of things. Now, yeah, I have a view that's a little bit old. It doesn't square with the book. Basically, we talk about training systems and processes. We've been talking about the curriculum architecture design system. Then there's the development acquisition system. Then you've got to tell the world that you got it and what you got and how you got it and how they can get it. They've got to have a way so they can plan their way through this and hopefully give you a demand forecast so you understand if you've got to leverage with vendors that I'm going to have 10 deliveries instead of two or 100 deliveries instead of five, you can start basically get a handle on what's the workload going to look like, how do you organize for that. Scheduling system, registration system, material system, delivery system, evaluation system, and some other things. This is where our, our model falls off. The most important thing about all this is this governance system or advisory system. When we do these curriculum architecture designs and we establish a steering team, I usually am talking to them the whole way through the project saying, yeah, I know you love it, I know you love it, but you still got to stay with us through this because we're just training people, we can still screw this up. <laughs> After the project is done, I somehow want to some find a way to trap them in future engagements with me so that they can help me because without their help, I'm going to be in trouble. And I need to talk them into becoming what I call a curriculum council. Somebody's got to own this curriculum and keep it up to date. Somebody's going to have to tell us when the performance model changes and therefore the knowledge and skills might change and the modules and the events and the path. I, I'm the training person. I'm, you got to tell me, so I got to organize my customers to work with me in the future. Also, I ask them to become a curriculum council. And usually, nine times out of ten, the steering team says, oh, God, don't worry about that. We're not letting go of this now. We got this to where we want it. We cannot let you people screw this up. Cool. That's exactly what I wanted. I want them to see such value in this thing here and, and, and such promise of a return that they're going to stay with me. Because that's part of our problem is that we've not been engaged with our customers well enough in the past. Post-project curriculum management kind of stuff. You see now I had to go fast because I'm almost out of time. So implementation, okay, we're just going to implement. All right, so you've got to develop, make or buy training modules and events, deliver them, all, the whole course development thing, and my intent was not to get into all this. The big issue here was the ongoing curriculum management. The curriculum manager, a training person, working with the curriculum council in order to implement, reprioritize, because as time goes on, priorities will shift, but we've got to keep the data that we have evergreen and understand its implications to the design. No different than anybody who's doing a, uh, managing a complex system product-wise and understanding all the black boxes as part of the system and where they are in their evolution in order to provide enhanced functionality over time. And we keep on adding functionality one way or another. And we keep updating and being uh, uh, connectable to the rest of whatever we need to connect with. So the world around us is going to change. Our world is going to change. How do we manage this? How do we do a change management thing? Same thing here. So we'll have to continually reconfigure training events and curriculum paths. As jobs change, as roles change, we've been forewarned about this by the rest of the world. As that change, if we can anticipate that all that's going to change, then the training we provide, the individual is going to have to change and be much more flexible and adaptable to that changes. Some change will be slow, some change will be fast. Our system has to be robust to be able to do it all. <clears throat> it's not easy and it's not pretty. Okay, and there'll be a little bit of time for questions, Q&A. The modular structure allows a prioritized approach to providing an end-to-end -end performance based knowledge and skill system, a learning system. It allows customization of these paths, their plan based on their needs and their incoming knowledge and skill set. If we understand the incoming knowledge and skill set, we'll modularize differently, we'll eventize differently in order to allow people to avoid training that's not truly needed by them at, for, to do their job. This uh, being directed by the advisory structure allows us to bring the piece parts of, tr of training to the marketplace as the customer wants them. Maybe they will take a car without the airbag and the radio, but I got to have brakes. Engine would be nice too. Uh, allows flexibility of use of delivery strategies. If we understand 
what our array of delivery strategies might be. Do we have computers so that we can do touch screen computer delivery at every desktop? No. So what can we do? What do we have? What's likely? What could we actually ask for and actually make happen? Is it feasible? This doesn't mean that as we're doing all this that we can't experiment with things, that we can't say, well, this doesn't make a lot of sense for CBT, but let's do it on this one now so we can learn something about this and have that be a conscious decision. Let's do this one in, uh, here in Indianapolis and bring everybody together and let them uh, see the corporate uh, headquarters and get to meet some people and do some other things besides. There's other kinds of learning that can happen too. Some of it's not just training and education. Sometimes there's other things that we want to affect by how we deploy and deliver this training, things we want to reinforce. Maybe it's time to bring everybody in so they can vent about the last change that we just put them all through. And we need to allow that to happen. This modular architecture structure varies by situation. Again, that's just kind of suggesting that five-tier thing. That's just the inventory scheme at the back of the, the training warehouse. All right, Ray Svensson coined the phrase curriculum architecture back in the 70s, working at uh, the Bell System Center for Technical Education, and he's supporting 30,000 engineers across the Bell System. <coughs> and within that, there was systems engineers, right? And so they have the, con uh, the uh, computer system, what is that? You said the phrase the other day. Anyway, he was talking to people that uh, do information systems, and they've got the concept of the architecture of the modules, the chunking of the coding. So you can enhance functionality for a software program by adding this coding next year, and the year after that, we'll add more functionality, and that's all got to work together. So somebody had to figure that out at the very beginning, how that was really going to work. So basically, that's where the concept of the architecture of a curriculum came from. And he published an article in 78 on that. Uh, training Magazine 84, NSPI's uh, Performance Instruction Journal in 84, and we have an unpublished article on performance-based management curriculum that he wrote in 86. And the last page is just phone numbers and that that you can call, ask for me, ask for Pete, if you have any questions about curriculum architecture that we don't get to today. But I have about 10 minutes left on my time slot, I believe, and uh, if you have questions, Comments, concerns, critiques, I'll be happy to take them. What are you looking for? Because you've had all the questions so far. <laughs> Big process. Yeah. How do you get people by? It's difficult. Uh, there's typically a knee-jerk reaction to it. It's overly complex. Um, and I guess my my retort to that is basically <clears throat> that in, if we're going to manage by data rather than by opinion, we have to have a data. And wrangling with data is inherently complex. I have to have a way to wrangle with it. Uh, you can shortcut this process. Again, I've done over 75 of these projects. I've never done any two of them alike. They all had to situationally be varied in order to be appropriate to my customer's needs. Sometimes we do these things very armchairish. We sit around a room and make up a bunch of stuff, and that was be appropriate. I, from an idealist standpoint in instructional technology, in the integrity of the instructional design, that's not the way to do it, but it was really the appropriate thing to do here is just not, not go through all those hoops. And there's places where we do need to go through those hoops and get a handle on this. So the, I sell it on, <clears throat> if you don't do this, how are you going to know you're really dealing with the really critical stuff and do proactively rather than find out that you got fires and part of your future fire prevention programs to put at the training end. I think you can get a handle on this. You can get a lot of shareability out of this thing. If you looked at the manufacturing world <clears throat> and all the design, engineering, technologies, and techniques <clears throat> that are being put in place right now, very equivalent to this. This is quality function deployment as applied to training. And quality function deployment, if, if you understand quality function deployment, you'll know everybody hates that one, too. It's too detailed. Yes, ma'am. I think the key that you keep driving uh and coming back to is a uh, sponsor group that makes the business decisions. Um, I, I can see aspects of us trying to do some, you know, we, we've tried to do some of these things, but um, without a steering committee that, to make those decisions, um, it, we do the best we can. Yeah. So what, do you have any thoughts on that? How, how do you implement that? I guess that uh, part of what I've learned over time is that you don't give credibility just because you want it. And no one's going to let you do what you think is the way to do this just because you think so. You have to earn that from them, and you have to do it their way. You can forecast what's problematic. I, I, we're going to process a guy, we will do it this way, and I'll 
well, you know, I'm the training person here, I can tell you, and, and eventually I have to say, okay, I'll do it your way, I think this is what will happen, but hey, I'll try my hardest, and you better, and I, now I gotta try my hardest to make that way work. And when it fails, I've learned that in the meetings, I gotta stand up and say, I screwed up, it's all my fault, I gotta take all the bullets, everybody knows I'm lying, they know who really decided that, I'm just doing it because I wanna get on with it and do good stuff. And then we'll go back and rework that. Now, do you think the next time they're gonna listen to me? No. <laughs> I got lucky the first time, that's all. So after two or three times of doing good stuff and having them trust me, then they may listen to me and I'll be able to do it more or less along the lines that I would like to do it. But I can't be so arrogant as to think that I really know exactly how to do this. They may be right. And so I think that's a key issue is that is winning over a steering team. And if you start something like this, if you embrace something like this, I'm transferring this into clients right now, you gotta start where you can be successful. You don't take the most politically uh, nightmarish thing on the corporate agenda and tackle that one for them. Uh-uh. Do something that's winnable. Let me, let me try uh, a little add-on to a couple of these. How some people have gotten into this, because it is difficult, oftentimes they've gotten into it either out of frustration or out of some driving business requirement. We're working with General Motors right now, and they've, over the last couple of years, they've established a twin pair of concepts that says, we're, our, our existing courses are gonna be gone through and we're gonna sort them down to the best under General Motors, which means instead of 14 soldering courses, we're only gonna pick one best soldering course or one basic engine design course or whatever it is. The other concept that goes along with that is a single point concept that says if somebody wants to develop a new course on X, we're going to go through a single point control mechanism to make sure that we're not going to develop, develop 14 of those. They're coming to this process because they couldn't figure out another way to implement their bug them and single point concepts without having some kind of a control mechanism like this curriculum architecture design that you flush all those things through as, as the inventory control for the whole training system. Another kind of driver that has gotten people into this is business process re-engineering. We're re-engineering all of our business processes. We know we're going to have, or some subset of our business processes, we know we're going to have massive training requirements coming out of this re-engineering. We've got to have a way to handle all this in a systematic, cost-effective way. That's the Spartan Stores example that that guy just gave you and a number of others. Um, some other examples, uh, we uh, got involved with the exploration department at Exxon a number of years ago. They had, they were hiring 250 brand new geologists and geophysicists a year to make up for losses during the oil boom in the early 80s. And they, and they had assigned some of their top geologists and geophysicists to create a training system for training these new folks so that they could become productive in less than the 10 years that it took, typically took. And these guys worked at it for over six months and, and were completely stymied until we got them involved in this process. And then it just came together in a very short period of time. So often you have to look for an opportunistic situation in the business where there's some business driver that says, we got to get our act together here. And, this is, and then now all of a sudden they, they may be interested in, a, in an approach that will that will do that. Um, in terms of getting the getting steering committees and advisory committees formed, uh, sometimes we fake them into it. And other, when when you're starting a project like this, you say, "Look, this is too complex. You got to you got to give us a steering committee for this project." And as he says, you know that can evolve into a, a into a standing curriculum council later. But, uh, also, you don't have to set up a separate steering team. You basically find somebody that's in charge of re-engineering, and you go there and present to them, scare them witless about you know, the training implications. And when are they going to invite you to play along and figure that out? Is that about the last minute, two minute drill here, you're creating all the training, or you can be part of the process up on the front end? So there's a whole bunch of adaptations you can make from this process because you got to retrofit into the real world that you are facing. So there's all these teams, you use them as a forum. If you have a mechanism to help them 
if they're going to create process maps out of the quality movement and re-engineer off something like that, can you utilize some of that and tap into that and keep all that data in alignment in the future? Does that sound like something that would be needed? Or is this all this re-engineering and then the training, is that just a one-shot deal and after that they'll figure it out because it'll be so friendly and easy and simplified? So I, I know that all of us look for very simple answers to deal with the complexities in our lives. And uh, most of those simple answers just haven't cut it. So we have a lot of clients who've basically heard this presentation in three or four years, they're back, they want to do it now, they try the other way. You know, and that's got to be part of their learning process as the organization learns. The, the lessons were all learned in the quality movement. You find things, you go, f I'm sure you have processes in, w that are similar in nature to this CAD process here in your corporation. Why are they doing it there? Why is that so important? Are the human assets and their competencies, their capabilities, their knowledge and skill sets, are they unimportant to the process? Are the processes so robust that people can have just about any set of knowledge and skills and the process will be okay? And that may be true in places where that's where you shouldn't do the training and spend the money, but there are other processes where, no, that's not true at all. It requires the human intervention. That's the key variable. Okay, let's, let's focus our money there. But how did you know that that, that was the place and not these other places? So you have to have a way to get through that. Uh, if you're, some of you may be familiar, familiar with the DACOM process, our General Motors clients spent over a year generating the data in the DACOM process, uh, which it stands for Design A Curriculum. It really is an analysis methodology. It is not a design methodology at all. But, but basically they spent that. They generated all this data, but they don't have any place to go with it now. There's no logical way to take all that data and go do the design. I know that by, by the fact that when I create modules and I've got a performance model, I, well, the first modules I articulate are, are the how-to modules that basically align directly to the performance model segments. I have a performance-based curriculum from there. It'll just be very inefficient because I'll have spreadsheets built into all sorts of mo those modules in policies and procedures, antitrust laws, whatever. I will have created a very, my, so my intent is to not be redundant and move things up from the fourth and fifth tiers to the third tier, which is the supporting stuff, which is where all the shareable stuff typically goes. That's not totally true, but that's where the bulk of my curriculum is. That's where the bulk of my redundant resourcing would have been. But yeah, I can appreciate the fact that if you look at this thing for the first time, it's very, very complicated. It looks like a lot of hard work. There's parts of it that are hard, there's parts of it that are easy. And it gets easier the third or fourth time you're doing this thing because you're building off of a base of something. And now, that's where you really roll. And it's where you're really going to leverage the initial investment. But the upfront investment, emotionally, is tough for people. Do all that, take these people out of that, spend this time, jump through all these hoops, what for? Can't we just build some training? Yeah, we've been doing that, didn't How do you like it so far? Yes? One thing you haven't talked about is the power of bringing in outside consultants meeting with VPs in the afternoon, which were, hopefully has a good impact also. <laughs> The other, the other point I want to make is you said it takes a high level of skill to do this. You grab all performance technology, instructional technology, um, facilitation skills, incredible amount. Someone who can be big picture in detail at the exact same time about how to analyze and synthesize all this data. Um, if we have a workforce who um, doesn't have backgrounds in training, the majority of people in our training environment are 30 some odd decentralized training groups with no centralized structure. How do we provide that skill? Not everybody needs it. Out of the entire engineering population of uh, Ford Motor Company, how many design engineers of cars do they need? We all have different roles to play. You need a couple of curriculum architecture designers, you need a whole bunch more performance and knowledge and skill analysts, you need a whole bunch more de training development folks. Depending on the delivery strategies you're going to use, you might need more or less of them. But those are different roles, and those require different knowledge and skills and competencies. I've been transferring this. We transferred this into, into, into a training organization at Amico, one of the bigger ones. Trained about 10 people. Two can do it for sure. Three might be able to do it when the dust settles, but the others, nah, they won't be able to do it. And we found that out by trying to train them. We don't have a very good front-end selection process because I don't understand the variables myself well enough. I probably am too close to it, never really been asked to look at that. When I've tried, I've, I've been uh, unsuccessful in articulating what are the key incoming success criteria. What, what do they really have to have? Done this with Hewlett Packard. I, so I know it can be done because I got, I got people who can look at the overheads here and they can go start doing this stuff. They don't even need to talk to me ever again. They've got it. They'll go with it. And there's other than these little coaching, and then they'll get it, and there are people who will never, ever get it. And that's okay. 
Um, because it does, I think, require being able to listen to five people talk simultaneously and write something on the flip chart that's pretty much okay for them. And not too far off like, oh God, you only listen to the other four people again. <laughs> you know, and that's tough. And I mean, there are people who can do that. I uh, can do that until about three o'clock. I go brain dead and then I can't do it either. So, um, but so I don't think that you really need to have an army of people that are doing, you have to have a lot of people who understand this. The developers have to understand, hey, I've been given this module assignment to develop. And uh, so therefore the contents, and I've got to work to make sure that I got to understand enough of the rest of the curriculum. I got to have line of sight of the rest of them so I don't try to inadvertently build in the same content. And that's typically what, what the development developers will do. But now you can set up a bunch of templates for development. You can make the whole development thing much easier because these modules, there's a lot of similarity. There's no need to have different designs for a lot of these modules. You can really affect this by creating template designs for a lot of content types. Yes? Does this create an advantage for an organization that is decentralized? And having a way to communicate with each other? I think so. It's the master curriculum. It doesn't really matter. I mean, in, in, in large, in, in like General Motors, they've got all these component factories. And this is the equivalent of having things built in a variety of places and pulling them all together. So we can share the workload to do the development. Now if you have these, if you have delivery issues and you have local delivery issues, local unique content, uh, you know, it may be that sharing this one thing here is inappropriate. Well then you create a competing, if you need something similar but different, now at least it's the module they should all basically work together. If it's a different database that they're using here than over here, well, then we just teach those differences and the rest of it is made intact. So we've minimized our future costs to meet a, a very local specific need. And you get into all sorts of funding stuff. Now, when I was at Motorola, I used to say that if, it's, if it met the needs of three out of the five big business sectors, you could develop it. Oh, that was terrible because <clears throat> that meant it was all worthless generic stuff that didn't teach people how to do their job. And here we were at corporate doing the same kind of a thing again. Oh, aren't we wonderful? But we had to have a way for people to actually localize that, which is another module that says, okay, here's how you take that time management stuff, that generics concepts and skills you learn, and now here's how you apply it in your sales management role. Or here's how you apply it as being an R&D team member or the team leader of a, I don't know, critical action team. So I think it, will, it holds huge advantage for you because it gives you a game plan. Everybody can see it. It's not real mysterious in terms of who's working on what. When's it all going to roll out? How do I deal? What am I going to get back locally? What do I have to build locally? What's the funding implications of all that? How do I engage the local customer to basically say how they would call out the priorities? You know, if you got 30 some different units of training, you got 30 some different locations, you got 30 number one priorities, you got 30 number two priorities, somebody's number two priority could be priority number 487. That's probably not right, I did the math wrong. Um, well, that may, no, I guess that could be. Um, so it gives you a way to actually deal with the data, because it's just data, it's less opinionated now. now. There's opinions that get factored into that, but you're still on a base of data. It won't make everything Nirvanian perfect, it'll just get it much better than the way it is now, I think. Can I try an, another spin on the answer to the decentralized thing? Um, when I was back with AT&T before the divestiture, we, we, had, we had 20 operating telephone companies. The Plant Training Advisory Board had responsibility for training 250,000 installers and repair people all over the country. But they were all, they were in 20 different telephone companies, each of which had its own training department. And they realized that, they, that nobody was doing very well, and they formed this plant training advisory board, and they adopted a similar concept here, and they started going looking for duplication. They found basic installation, you're installing the same kind of telephone instrument, using the same practices, the same technical requirements, the same tool set. They went looking for how many insta basic installation courses they had. How many do you think they had? 150. Each state has its each own. Each state had its own, and each little district had its own, because we had trainers scattered all over the place. Were they able to find any that, that the whole community was able to say, this is the best, and we're going to share this? No. So they, they adopted a training development standards approach where the things that would be shared all had to go through a common training development process, which was a formative evaluation and control thing. And so you go through job analysis, design, development, pilot testing, revision. And if you, if you go through that and you train everybody, and we got it under the curriculum control of this 
training board will all agree to share the training. Now, they didn't centralize the course. This company over here is going to do the splice module structure because we may have basic installation in French, basic installation in English, Chinese, etc. Uh, one of our clients, AT&T Network Systems, is doing all of their technical documentation and training using this kind of a thing. And they've, they've also got an automated translation uh, tool so that they can translate into some 20 or 30 different languages using a computer with a pretty high degree of reliability. But, uh, but actually, that's the only way to address that, is to find out what's common and what's not. Yeah. Performance model, is this how you do it in Europe? My Hewlett Packard client that I'm uh, transferring this technology, they're re-engineering an entire order fulfillment process that's worldwide. It's global. They're stepping up to the same issues here. They're going to impose a global process on the company. And they're going to train everybody, but there still will be those local differences. They know those things because the laws are different, let alone you know, how the customers want to be, have business done with them.